Surgical and Post-Surgical Management of Triangular Fibrocartilage Complex Injuries by Habib Badwale, Tim Ashley, Matt Geringer, and Ashley Trotter. The anatomical components of the TFCC include the dorsal and anterior radial ulnar ligaments, the central articular disc, the meniscus homolog, the extensor carpial nerve subsheath, the ulnar collateral ligament, and origins of the ulno lunate and luno triquetral ligaments. As you can imagine, since there are so many components to the TFCC, there's a multitude of types of injuries that can occur there. Here's a picture of the TFCC. You can see how it gets its name. This acts as the major tissue stabilizer of the distal radial ulnar joint, or the drudge, as we'll call it for short. It also helps to stabilize the ulnocarpal joint and allows for the wrist motion in multiple planes. It is responsible for the transferring of ulnar sided carpal loads to the ulna. The TFCC is responsible for transmitting part of the axial load at the wrist. Percentage of this load transferred is determined by the ulnar variance one has. Ulnar variance is described as positive, neutral, or negative. This refers to the difference in length between the distal ends of the radius and the ulna, functionally. Positive is when the ulna is longer than the radius, neutral is when they are even, and negative is when the ulna is shorter, which is more common of the three. Vascular supply comes from the terminal branches of the anterior and posterior interosseous arteries. Central and radial portions of the complex are avascular and are considered the debridement zone. Peripheral margins and radial ulnar ligaments are well vascularized and are considered the repair zone. These two components play a large role in the severity, prognosis, and the surgical management approach taken to treating TFCC injuries. So as you can imagine, since the TFCC is considered the primary stabilizer of the drudge, disruption results in potential destabilization of the wrist and can severely limit wrist function. So like with many musculoskeletal injuries, there are two primary types of injuries, acute and chronic. Further classification besides acute and chronic will be discussed later. Acute injury mechanisms may include fall on extended pronated wrist, over distraction of the ulnar side of the wrist, marked ulnar deviation, and these may include up to 40% of acute radial fractures with drudge instability. Chronic injury mechanisms may include progressive degenerative changes such as arthritic changes in the proximal carpal row, marked ulnar deviation, ulnar impaction against the carpus, which typically occurs most often in people with positive ulnar variants. The Palmer classification is commonly used in determining the damage to the TFCC. Type 1 are traumatic or acute injuries that can be identified as stable versus unstable. Swift surgical intervention is dependent on the severity. The debridement zone is avascular and as we've said before the repair zone is vascular. For those of you who are visually inclined, this graphic displays the acute TFCC in its tears A through D. A is the disc, B the periphery, C is the palmar aspect, D is the radial attachment. This table displays the type 2 or degenerative or chronic injuries to the TFCC due to normal aging and arthritis. This is a continuum. For example, type 2B includes type 2A and type 2D includes type 2C. A is the least severe while E is the most severe or progressive. Here is a short list of the differential diagnoses of the TFCC and its injuries. Uh, Park et al. states this to be the low back pain differential diagnosis of the wrist. As stated before, the TFCC is a part of the distal radial ulnar joint, and studies have shown that after a distal radius fracture, there is a 60 to 84 percent chance that the TFCC and drudge are injured as well. So, when going through the exam, keep in mind that the there is a possibility of TFCC tear when there is a fracture, and vice versa. A TFCC tear is mostly a clinical diagnosis based on history and physical examination findings. A trauma such as a fall, motor vehicle accident, or sport, sports or work-related injury should get the attention of the examiner when clinically diagnosing a TFCC tear. Any popping or clicking and point tenderness are signs consistent with a tear as well. 
Furthermore, a dorsal to palmar translation greater than 1 centimeter has a specificity of 96% for ruling in drudge instability relating to TFCC tear. Diagnosing a TFCC tear in the athlete is similar to a regular clinical diagnosis, except for two special tests. The TFCC stress test and the piano key sign are helpful in determining the instability of the drudge. To perform a TFCC stress test, the patient's sh shoulder and arm are flexed to 90 degrees, and the physical therapist applies an axial load to the fifth digit and passively flexes and extends the wrist. A positive test is popping or clicking. The piano key sign is similar to Lindau's instability test. Radiographic imaging techniques should be the last resort in diagnosing a TFCC tear. MRI is generally 90 to 100 percent sensitive. In a study by Joshi et al., MR arthrography yielded a high predictive value in detecting full tears. However, when combining MR arthrography and MRI, accuracy is increased. Finally, when other investigations have proven inconclusive, arthroscopy is the most accurate tool for diagnosing TFCC injuries. The surgical intervention chosen depends on the type of injury, traumatic or degenerative, type 1 or 2, the severity of the trauma, the structures damaged, meaning classifications A through E, patient's pain and irritability, and the existing range of motion and strength post-injury. The choices for surgery include arthroscopic as well as open surgery, and these could be repairs of the TFCC structures or debridement, usually of the central disc, and arthroscopic or wafer procedures as well as possible ulnar shortening procedures. Conservative treatment may be attempted and includes immobilization to promote healing and decrease instability at that joint, restoration of range of motion, and strengthening. Even with conservative treatment, surgery may still be required. Goals of post-surgical treatment include the promotion of healing, management of the wound site, and regaining range of motion and strength. In order to do this, immobilization for up to three weeks and full supination may be required, and then subsequent manual techniques and strengthening exercises will be included. For outcome measures for TFCC injury, we're going to use the DASH, or Disability of Shoulder, Arm, and Hand Questionnaire, made up of two components, the Disability or Symptom section, made up of 30 items, scored 1 through 5, and the Optional High Performance section for Sport, Music, or Work, which is 4 items. Uh, we're also going to use the Patient Rated Wrist Evaluation, which is 5 items for Pain and 10 items for Function, scored 0 to 10. 0 being no difficulty and 10 being unable to perform the activity. And lastly, the Gartland and Worley scores, which are determined by the clinician after the post-surgical physical examination, in which the patient's range of motion is compared to norms and then graded. The prognosis of TFCC injuries depends on the severity of the injury and the chosen interventions. Acute injuries, defined as tears in the periphery, generally have a shorter prognosis due to excellent vascularity. Conversely, chronic injuries that are accompanied by drudge instability and degeneration often lead to a more complex prognosis and usually end up in a surgical situation. In reference to chronic TFCC injuries, arthroscopic repair of the complex favors the best prognosis. This procedure is the safest and causes the least harm. Several studies report a 90% success rate with this method of intervention. Furthermore, 70 to 85 percent of patients with chronic TFCC injuries report no pain after arthroscopic management. Here are some general guidelines for the prognosis of TFCC injuries. Evidence indicates that conservative management of TFCC injuries requires 6 to 16 weeks. If two months of conservative treatment is unsuccessful, surgical intervention is warranted. Return to work or sport takes approximately 6 to 12 weeks, while surgery and post-surgical interventions may require 20 weeks. To wrap up our presentation, we'll leave you with this clinical bottom line, that while conservative treatment should be considered, surgical intervention will likely be indicated due to patient factors and the type of TFCC injury. The mechanism of injury and severity of the injury directly affect its intervention and prognosis. We hope you've enjoyed the presentation and thank you for listening.